but I joined the Army in June of 1964, so the war in Vietnam was beginning to heat up. I would get the intuitive feeling, usually within a few minutes, we'd, we'd get harassment shelling. I always seem to zig instead of zag at the right time, so. Yes, I'm Remote Viewer 001. Remote viewing is uh, the ability to describe, draw, or talk about a place, an object, a person, an event, somewhere in space-time that you have no other access to except your mind. I can give you an example. An individual wrote his social security number on a white card, and the card was put inside of a sealed envelope, and I was then asked to describe where that person was standing and what they were doing. The entire remote viewing session took about 15 minutes, and this is what I drew. And I said it was a rolling hill with things moving in a circular motion producing power. So this is a near 100% perfect remote viewing. The very concept that you can just sort of conjure up information about a place you've never, never been to or never seen, uh, from targeting data that you've never seen, uh, sounds very impossible. I'm still surprised when I'm right. I mean, it's magic. I'm Uri Geller, and I became famous for reading minds, being able to pluck out a thought or a name or a color, a name of a city. My other abilities are to concentrate on a compass and deflect the needle, or to hold um, radish seeds in my hand, focus on them and touch them gently, and you say, grow. Grow, grow. Yes, yes. Yes, I can feel it. It's coming, it's happening. Come on, come on. Come on, grow. Grow, grow. The seed would start sprouting. But I became famous around the world with, with this feat of spoon bending. I discovered my strange abilities when I was very young, four years old. The first time was eating soup and suddenly the spoon bent and broke in half. My mother was obviously amazed and say, bend, bend, bend. What goes through my mind when I bend a spoon is really talking to the metal. I just say, bend, bend. Strangely, I say it in English. <laughs> bend, bend. And I always hope that it'll bend. When I will look into the camera and I will look into people's eyes at home, it's not going to be my powers that will fly through the airwaves into the camera and out from their TV sets into their living rooms and fix the broken watches or the broken house appliances or move a spoon or bend a key. It's going to be their powers. I'm only a trigger. I'm only a catalyst. When people experience it at home, it is mind-blowing. I feel like I had a gift at a very young age. I didn't perceive things quite the same as other people. When I would take a test, I would start coming up with answers that wasn't even in the book. The teacher knew enough to know that it was a correct answer, but she said, where did you get this? <laughs> I like to think it's a clear thinking, and that's what clairvoyance means. I see it more as a sensing than power. What interested me was could a psychic work with archaeological types of problems, 
in the same way that psychics often work with police or investigative types of problems. I came up with what's called a triple blind experiment. I asked a colleague of mine to acquire from a colleague of his 10 artifacts, and these items would be wrapped up in, in wads of cotton, sealed in boxes, given to the, the fellow that I talked to who then gave them to me. So Albert would look at it and he'd start giving his impressions. I, I don't really tell you what's in the box by seeing through the box. And it's not a memory, but it's like a memory. The, the best way I can describe, it's like uh, remembering somebody you used to know. This is the first drawing he did. And he says there's these two things, he has the color red. And then he says he sees a gold spiral like this. And then he stopped and he said, I hear a Scottish accent. And uh, what was in the box are the antique false teeth of the mayor of Edinburgh. When you come away from dealing with Albert, you're not so sure anymore that the world is just, you know, all squared off and set up. Something else is happening. The work that I do involves communicating with the other side to use myself as a telephone in between the spirit world and the physical world. That pain, you just never lose it. I have found through the many years of doing this work that losing a child is extremely painful. The parent has all of their hopes and their dreams on that child. In a way, they want to see their own immortality go on with that child. I needed to know, does he hear me when I talk to him? Where is he? Where's heaven? Is it far, far away? When I met Bill and Donna, um, I didn't know who they wanted to contact. And I told them that someone in the room was there named Chris, and I had a sense it was their son. Next, he showed me a, a car, and it was an accident, and he showed me the details, the whole situation, about how he passed over. There's no greater loss than the loss of a child. I was having a very difficult time uh, accepting Chris's death. Chris came through and said to his dad, Dad, I'm going to use your hands one day. And no one knew what that meant. And months later, He's starting feeling heat in his hands. And now Bill does healing work for other people. I always tell people that, um, of course, I would give anything to have our, our son back, to have that have not happened. Well, after the reading with James, there's no doubt. It was our son's body that died, not our son. What I do is rather specialized, and it has a certain mystery around it. The pendulum is one of my favorite tools. It's, it's an instrument that we can all use to tap into our subconscious, things that we do know, but didn't know we know. We know something, or we feel some, or we suspect something, but consciously, we do not know. Well, the pendulum helps us decide in those cases. The pendulum actually translates an intuition in our minds into movement. I use it basically for navigating, try to find lost objects, um, try to match lovers. This is a dowsing rod. It's a much more difficult tool to handle. You have to stretch it until it becomes instable. Then it can go two ways. It can go down or it can go up. You scan directions, you try to navigate. When you get a reading, you know in that direction I must proceed. It's your intuition that actually decides these movements. The miracle happens in your mind.
during my childhood, I, was, I would always do tricks for people because I thought it was kind of fun. Have them hide the penny somewhere in the woods. So I get the penny and bring it to them and they think, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. If we wish to know something that a person is thinking or feeling, if we were to begin to focus on what thoughts are being shared, that comes in like a uh, movie, like little skits, very important skits of a film that uh, have been recorded in your consciousness. Thought flows in just like water in a stream. Psychic powers and not powers. It's the way the mind operates, it's thought. For the mind to connect to thought is as natural as for blood to flow into a vein. I remember people thinking I was rather strange, rather odd, but I always had the ability to let them know that I wasn't and that this was something that was in, within them as well. How many people are afraid of insects, snakes, heights? How many people have fears that they've had all their life and, and they can't overcome the fears no matter how hard they try consciously? With hypnosis, what you're able to do is to eliminate fears. And under deep hypnosis, you're able to neutralize that anxiety that someone might have had for 20 years almost instantly. Closing sleep, head dropping down. With hypnosis, you can actually remove the unwanted emotions or habits and replace them with positive habits and behaviors. You can place your hands on your lap. You can close your eyes. You can imagine yourself just letting go of your muscles, relaxing. Hypnosis session can take anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours. But once they're hypnotized, once you have their trust, then you have instant access into the subconscious mind. When you're hypnotized, you tap into where the emotions are, where your habits and patterns are, where maybe your whole life script is developed. You know, our subconscious mind remembers everything. Under deep hypnosis, I can take a person back to December 10th, 1962 at 8, 8 o'clock in the morning, and they could tell you exactly what they were doing. They could be reliving that memory. Your body's going to relax. You're going to enter into a very deep, relaxed sleep. If the mind's created it, the mind can neutralize it instantly. Three, four, five, eyes open wide awake. How do you feel now? And it almost comes off looking like a miracle. We store all memories, all associations, from the time that we are born and beyond. I have had clients who've come in that have fears and phobias, and they don't know why. I use past life regression a lot to access those memories of times in which you may have lived, to find where these habits got started. I just want to avoid it, you know. If I can take a hundred mile detour, I'll miss the lake, thanks. When I first went to Michelle, I thought, I doubt that this is ever going to work for me. But it, I found myself working back through my life. I was going off in a car with a young man, and we drove to this large, still body of water. And we were necking in the car. And somehow, when the car started to roll, just nosed off into the water, and the, the water came 
rushing in. I'm just pouring in on it. And I, I was never so scared in my life. I mean, it was, it was just real. I've seen people come in and they have very strong emotional releases, whether it's crying, whether it's screaming. And I've seen people physically have convulsions with it that, that just needs to get out. And there's something else that, that sometimes we have not tapped into that hypnosis and past lives can. Thank you.